Hello everyone, welcome to today's meetup. Today we will be talking about translating data into a shared knowledge, shared language. And our speaker, Deidre Downing, will be with us. Uh, Deidre is a lead data storytelling trainer at Story IQ, where she helps organizations improve their communication with data. Uh, Deidre is an ad adjunct, adjunct lecturer at Hunter College in New York and has spoken at NCTM, INACOL, and Learning Forward about adult learning methodology and best practices in professional learning. Before we start, I'd like to talk about our company, Magnemind Academy. Uh, we founded in 2015, and we've been organizing data-related courses since 2015. We have different types of programs, including our full-stack data science bootcamp, our project-based learning project mentorship bootcamp and our mini bootcamps. One of the bootcamps, one of the programs that is about to start is our dual postgraduate certificate program, which we organize with Vistula University in Europe, Warsaw. Uh, during the bootcamp, you will learn about data analytics and visualization, machine learning, deep learning, AI seminars and interview practices. Anyone, any participant who graduates from our program will receive a postgraduate diploma from Vistula University and a course completion certificate uh, from Magnemind Academy. Uh, the bootcamp will start on November 17th and it will take 16 weeks. You can check our website to learn more about uh, our programs, the details. Uh, my friends, my teammates will share the necessary links on the chat so you can check that. Having said that, I would like to announce Deidre Downing for her speech. Thank you. Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me um, today. Sorry, just making sure that I get my, uh, get everything set up here. Um, so welcome to uh, my talk today where I want us to just take a little bit to consider how we're able to translate data into a shared language. Um, so I'm excited to be here with you. Uh, I'm joining you from Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, it has been a tiring seven months uh, with doing everything virtually, uh, our meetings, our Zoom hangouts with friends. Uh, but one thing that I really appreciate is the fact that I can join you, uh, which seems to be a Silicon Valley based meetup, though a couple people have said hello from uh, different locations. So I know that you're all spread out right now. Uh, but I do genuinely uh, love that we can all be in this room together. Um, so I'll get us started here. Um, what we're going to sort of cover tonight is uh, in our short time together, we want to <clears throat> dive into understanding the importance of designing for an audience. Um, if our goal is to have a dialogue with stakeholders and decision makers, we can't always start with the data. Um, and so we want to think about our audience and what they need as we are considering our analysis and considering how we want to share that analysis and then how we drive action through um, our analysis. So it's not just enough to do an incredibly impressive analysis, uh, but really how do we get decision makers to move on our recommendations and to really understand and internalize what it is we offer them. Um, this was the, it's a little confused here. My bullets were out of order. Uh, my first one here is why we're gonna talk about why we can't always just start with the data, why it can't be our first priority. Um, we're gonna look at how it can be really powerful to invite your audience uh, to share in your expertise, uh, particularly if they're not someone with uh, an expertise in data um, and how you can invite them in by doing some real basic translating of your work into uh, a shared common language. Uh, and some of that has to do with the, the choices and visuals you make. Um, and then we'll have some time for, for a question and answer. So I'm looking forward to diving in with you on this. Um, 
I am actually generally really used to doing a regular Zoom, not a Zoom webinar. So uh, generally I ask people to like annotate on the screen, but it doesn't look like that's gonna be possible tonight, which is totally fine. Um, but I will keep an eye on the Q&A window and the chat window. So if you've got questions, please feel free to pop them in and I will make sure uh, they, they can answer. Okay, so let's really understand this piece before we go any deeper. Um, not everyone speaks data. And so I'm just curious, and, and this is hard to uh, gauge <laughs> sometimes, but you know, have you had a conversation in the past couple of weeks with someone who doesn't have your level of data expertise or interest? And just thinking about that, like, how did that go? Um, did that person have sort of the appropriate nodding and noises that you would make, just like following along with the conversation? Could you tell if their focus was on another screen, right? They were really into their email or something else that was maybe not data related. Um, or perhaps you even just caught a glimpse of a game they might have been playing on their phone. And this is a challenge when we try to engage people in a database conversation who don't speak data as naturally as we do. Um, so let me share with you just for a moment uh, what that experience is like for someone who pops into a database conversation but doesn't actually speak that language. I think that this will work, let's see. Oh, it doesn't want to work. Okay, give me one second. We'll go to plan B. Oh, here it goes. And so on and so forth. Right. This conversation, I don't know if you've ever seen this video before, it delights me every time I watch it. Uh, but these two babies, these twin toddlers have an entire conversation in just a language that they understand. And they're having a phenomenal time with it. Uh, they're laughing at each other. They're enjoying it. But the people observing the conversation have no idea what's going on. And that's what it's like to be involved in a conversation with people who are talking about really complicated data and analysis when that's not the language that you speak. So what I want us to really focus on is considering this possibility that we all become data translators. And before I go any deeper into this, I do think it's important that I come clean to you. I am not a data scientist. I'm middling at best in using R and Python, and I'm pretty sure I couldn't accurately explain a neural net even if you offered me $1,000. But what I am is a numbers person, and that means that I crave to understand data and its patterns, but I'm not an expert in finding those or developing visuals on my own. I am a data enthusiast and what I would call a dedicated data translator. And if you're in this virtual room right now, uh, I imagine that you're either very much into data science or you respect data and prescribe an importance to sharing data and using data to make decisions. So let's pause for a moment and think about everyone who is not in the room right now. Our bosses and our teammates who might cringe when we bring numbers into a conversation. Um, your colleagues whose eyes maybe glaze over as you start talking about the newest program that you've written, or your partner, your spouse, or your roommate who really doesn't care what you do all day, right? So we want to think about those people. And we need to think of ourselves as data translators if we want our work to be understood and celebrated by those who are not in the room with us. Because those people, those people who don't speak language fluently are often our audience, which means that without simplifying our complex analysis, we need to make sure that we're able to communicate the impact and importance of our analysis with them and drive them to action. So 
before my life uh, in data and, and at Story IQ where I am now, I spent 10 years teaching high school math in New York City. And in this role, uh, I very quickly learned that my fluency in math and patterns did not equip me to be a math teacher. In fact, my numeracy probably made me a very difficult teacher to learn from because I didn't realize that I needed to interpret the language that I was speaking into something that my students could understand. And taking the time to then consider that level of translation, that level of interpretation that needs to happen for you to be able to succinctly communicate with a non-data professional is the first step in helping you be able to move your work from informing with data to influencing the data. So to help us think about the value of that idea of translation and making your analysis really stick out, uh, I want us to take a quick peek at the subreddit data is beautiful. Um, so sorry, I see a hand raised here. My apologies. I'm uh, making sure that I'm going to answer the question. So if you have a question, just make sure you pop it in the uh, question and answer area or the chat. I don't think I can unmute you to, oh, I can allow you to ask a question. Um, so I guess you can raise your hand if you'd like, although I don't really get a signal with who is raising their hand. So yeah, if you pop something in the, the chat box for me or the uh, q and I'll make sure we pause for it. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, let's pop into for a second, uh, the subreddit data is beautiful, um, which I love to check out for some inspiration to see what people are visualizing. Um, and so this is, you know, different every day, depending on what people add in. Um, but here we have day length as the year progresses. It's a little animated visual here. Okay. Um, Trump's interruptions uh, in a debate. So this is timely. Uh, president's previous experience in government. A lot of U.S.-based things here. Um, Oh, you can't see my screen, right? Because I think it's making me share an application. My apologies, everyone. There you go, that's probably easier. Sorry, <laughs> doesn't just take my desktop. Um, so, right, just going through these, these are all analysis and visualizations that were really interesting for the person who created them. But you can't just really skim it and understand the why of why it's being shared, other than the fact that it might be personally interesting. And it might not actually be displayed in a way that you immediately understand its importance or its impact. Um, oh, I have a, a personal vendetta against pie charts. So this animated pie chart really gets me, right? So, the reason we want to consider being translators and thinking about bringing the most important element of our analysis up is that outsiders don't necessarily see the importance and the relevance of what you're sharing, either because they don't know the data, they're not, um, you know, adept with the analysis that you did. And so we need to go that extra step to make sure that they really understand what you're talking about so that you can have a, a, a quality communication with them and really invite your stakeholders in. Okay, so this is our aim to be some data translators. And just in full transparency, uh, this guy here was me for many years. Uh, I would get super excited when presented with a new data set. And so I worked for the New York City Department of Education, uh, which meant that I had massive data sets to work with. Uh, it might've been student data of which there's 1.1 million students in the system and over 100,000 teachers. Um, so, you know, I had these huge data sets to jump into and the appeal was certainly there. Uh, but what I learned is decision makers didn't want me to just run off and play with data. They wanted me to sit down with them and understand what they needed, not what I thought was interesting after doing a really deep dive into the data. And this secondary importance that's put on finding out what our audience needs and wants is often why some data projects fail 
to live up to expectations or make the impact we want or to keep moving up the chain of decision makers. And so that idea of focusing on our audience and what they need and asking the right question is a key component to starting that translation process, making sure that we're talking about metrics that are important to our audience and that are going to drive decisions forward. Um, I'll pause here for a second. Uh, Dave has asked, am I opposed to all pie charts or only animated pie charts? Uh, all pie charts. Uh, I think there's a, there's a place if they're designed well, animated is just a little much. Um, but that goes into uh, just the amount of work it takes people to easily encode and estimate values in pie charts. Uh, so based on the work of William Cleveland and Robert McGill, uh, they did some really interesting studies on uh, the effort and accuracy it takes people to encode uh, value to different visual elements based on uh, different properties of data visualization. And so pie charts rely on angle and area, uh, which were very inaccurate. Uh, at. And so I try to stay away from pie charts because it involves uh, people needing to use a lot of cognitive energy to interpret them. Uh, and if we add in all the information they need, sometimes it makes the visual really cluttered. Um, so that's my, my beef with pie charts. Okay. So back to our idea of focusing on our audience. Um, we get really caught up in data, in big data, and sometimes forget about the other skills that we need to bring to the table when it comes to being a data scientist. So I'm just going to pull, uh, I did a quick search of uh, skills that uh, data scientists or data analysts need. Um, and so this is a brief list from Northeastern's graduate program and analytics. And they're saying some top skills are knowing SQL, being able to code in R and Python. Can't see my slides now. Is that true? Can you guys not see my slides? Uh, I can through? actually see your slides fine. Oh, okay, great. Looks like they're coming through now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if you get any like visual delays, just give it like 30 seconds or so. Sometimes there is a Zoom delay there. Okay. So skills for anal analysts, unsurprising, SQL, coding in R and Python. But then they also include things like Excel, critical thinking, data visualization, presentation skills, and then followed up with machine learning. And honestly, I'm unsure if this list is ranked. Uh, but what I'm really actually interested in here is the fact that Excel, critical thinking, data viz, and presentation skills are up there before machine learning. And so often there's this rush to share the fact that you've learned the newest language uh, and you can program in it fluently, um, or to rack up the number of data science projects you've completed, uh, share your Tableau public page, and while hard data skills are definitely a key component in many data science jobs and being successful in data science jobs, this list gives me some hope that data pro programs out there are realizing that there is an essential role that what I'm going to call like soft skills play in having a successful data career. And so at my company, uh, which is called Story IQ, we often talk to organizations about the need to identify individuals who are data evangelists, uh, those individuals who can bridge the gap between data teams and business leaders and decision makers. And this is a person who values database decision making and the role data can play in driving a business and can navigate the data world and the business world. And what this list here, uh, and this is from Northeastern University's graduate program in uh, analytics. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, just one graduate programs list, but there's a bunch out there like this. Um, what I see from this list is this role of the data evangelist, the person who can bridge both worlds, the business world and the data world, is an increasingly important skill. And we definitely see this. Uh, and the need for this with many of the organizations that we work with. And this role of data evangelist is really there to help translate what does the business need to the data scientists and what do the data scientists learn, uh, give that to the business team. So it's all a piece here of translating that work. Okay. And what that tells me is in many of our jobs, 
we get to a certain point where actionable skills are actually more impressive than knowing the newest coding language. And just because you can write a predictive program doesn't always mean that you should. And so let's take a minute to consider those soft skills on Northeastern's list and the role that that plays in our work, right? Because you might be poo-pooing Excel, like, oh, I would never do any work in Excel. But Excel is actually a really important tool in most businesses. Uh, it's what many of us grew up, grew up using uh, before, you know, we could learn to code in Python or we use R for major analysis. Um, and a lot of people have never moved past Excel. And while it's, you know, I guess a technical skill, it's nowhere in the same league as being able to write code. And for years, Excel has been the business standard in analysis. And right, we share spreadsheets back and forth. We need to use them with members of our organization that don't speak uh, Python, right? We need to be able to share that analysis in both a format that they understand and a file format that they can download. Um, and so we need to embrace the fact that Excel is really not going anywhere fast and make sure that you're able to do basic and intermediate analysis in Excel. Um, I've taught a bunch of classes where recent graduates get stuck in doing pivot tables. Um, they really wanna just throw everything into Python or R and start doing a deep analysis on the data. Um, but when they do that, they really struggle to figure out how to put that analysis into a presentation um, because the visuals that come out of that are hard to integrate into PowerPoint. Um, the options to change those visuals is often a little bit uh, challenging. So let's not poo poo Excel and think about how we can bridge the gap and translate data by using a tool that more people have access to and understanding of. Right? So I agree with Excel on that list of, of key skills, not necessarily for the analysis piece, but the translation piece. Okay. Critical thinking. I have read so many posts by data science influencers that give interview advice. And I think the most popular, most common piece of interview advice I read on these posts is to stress the value that your data project brings, not patting yourself on the back on the really complicated and crazy programming you did in the course of this project. And what I've found organizations needs is someone who understands the challenges they're facing and can use data to bring value to the table in solving those challenges or addressing those challenges. Not someone who can code the most beautiful program that is not actionable based on what the business needs. So this critical thinking, understanding how the data links to serious business challenges and problems you wanna solve is definitely a key component that we all need as part of our translation toolkit and also to help us move our rules forward. Data visualization, right? Seems like, you know, this is an obvious need for analysts, but I wanna pull back from the idea of the fact that we all need complicated data visualization skills. Uh, access to data viz software is prevalent. We can do some really, really cool things with data viz with the programs out there without actually doing too much work. But again, just because we can, doesn't mean we always should. And so just think back to that, the Reddit we looked at a few minutes ago. Some of those visuals are really complicated and they don't really tell us why we need to care about the data. And what complicated visuals can do is leave your audience wondering how they even start interpreting the, in, uh, the information you're sharing. Um, that doesn't really impress uh, your, your audience the way you may be hoping those visuals will. So I want us to step back from complicated visuals and think about building our skills on creating visuals that aid in understanding and interpretation. They serve as part of the translation process. And that's an indispensable skill, being able to really pull back and think about what is the simplest, most uncluttered, straightforward way to present visually the data that you are sharing. And we'll look at a couple of examples of that a little bit later. Right. Yeah. So someone has just uh, added in the QA here, don't we have Power BI and Tableau to make things easy for data translation? Sure. But if you're sending data around, like this is if you're dealing with big data sets, um, the, I don't know, I'm trying to think, I don't, I don't know outside of my current company where we're all very data focused. Um, I never worked for someone who 
I could send them a dashboard and they would understand immediately what they needed. They needed me to hold their hand a little bit. They were much more comfortable in Excel. And so while Tableau and Power BI do a great job of breaking down bigger data sets, they help us very quickly visualize that data. They're not necessarily the best tool sometimes for engaging your stakeholders in conversation. And so, yeah, I completely agree that Tableau and Power BI save a lot of time. They're great for analysis, but we should also just be open to the fact that sometimes we're going to need to fall back on Excel and tools that we may not think of as, as powerful as something that we work with to help in, uh, engage our audience and help them understand our work. Okay. okay. The last one that I want to touch on from Northeastern's list here is presentation skills. Being able to communicate about your work and its impacts and value is a skill that will set you apart from other data professionals. So knowing when and how to transform technical information and analysis into a language that all of your stakeholders can understand is going to earn you greater engagement and open up real conversations uh, with your stakeholders, with your decision makers in a way that can help you influence how they act and get them to remember that you're sort of their go-to person when they have they run into a challenge. And so presentation skills in a virtual setting, difficult <laughs> to build on, right? There's a whole different way to present virtually than in person, but thinking about how you communicate and the steps you take to planning your communication around data is essential if you want your stakeholders to be a part of that conversation with you and be able to really act on what you're sharing. So this is a little ageist here, but I saw this image and I immediately thought of who I'm often uh, in a position to explain analysis to. Um, a lot of times it's people who are very senior in an organization. They may have worked with data in the past, but they're not sort of fluent in current languages. They haven't really thought about doing regressions in a long time. And what's really important is to be able to step back and think about where is your audience coming from? right? Understanding their comfort with different tools and jargon and see really, really important in knowing what level of translation your work is going to need. And we don't want to make assumptions about the underlying knowledge of a process or program that our stakeholders have. We want to be extra attentive to the fact that we're clear about the impact and results of our analysis. And as we're talking through that, being really strategic about including information about the process, um, and leaving that out, if that's not information that's essential to your audience's understanding and could potentially confuse them. So we want to pull out what's key and translate that and what it means for the question they asked you to solve, um, but not get overly technical. And part of this is thinking about our approach to solving problems. Uh, diving headfirst into data is appealing. I am the first to admit uh, that I love trying to find a small or obscure nugget of interesting uh, information in a giant data set. I want to make a really powerful connection. I want to find a pattern that no one has seen before. But this approach takes time, right? It focuses on what we're interested in, which is figuring out, right, exactly what's happening in this data set down to the smallest detail. And doesn't necessarily allow us to focus on the bigger problem or challenge that we want to address. And so we have a real simplistic example here of somehow at times how data can get in our way and can make it a little bit harder for decision makers to make a decision unless we translate what we've done in our analysis for them. So this is uh, our example here is going to look at a challenge that is a struggle almost daily in my house, and that is what to have for dinner. So the big problem that I'm trying to solve here is what my husband Ryan and I should have for dinner tonight. So I just noticed there's a missing space in my slide there. Let's ignore that. Um, so all Ryan has told me is whatever we have for delicious, uh, sorry, whatever we have for dinner needs to be delicious and reasonably priced. Completely reasonable expectations for dinner. And so my major stakeholder here, right, my key decision maker is my husband, Ryan. And the options for what to have for dinner are virtually limitless. 
I live in Brooklyn, and so I can have almost any cuisine delivered or the ingredients to cook a full meal delivered in a relatively short period of time, if I'm willing to pay for it. And so in this problem, time is really of the essence and determining how to limit my problem space and therefore the data that I actually need to consider is an essential part of solving this problem. So bigger problem, what do we have for dinner? I'm gonna, instead of diving into all of the options and listing out what's possible, try to break this problem down into something a little bit smaller, something a little more focused to help Ryan make a decision. And so I limit my problem space, I sort of cut it in half. We can either cook or someone else can cook for us. And it's been a long day. So I'm gonna go with someone else cooks for us. And then our options are, well, do we go out or do we order in? And the idea of ordering out, or sorry, the, the idea of dining out in New York is still a little bit iffy and it's getting cold outside. So outdoor dining is not that enjoyable. So I'm gonna go with, we're gonna order in. And narrowing this down even more, thinking about how long it will take. Do I have more than half an hour to wait for dinner or do I need that delivered any faster? And Ryan, who's my key stakeholder in this, gets hangry. So I know it needs to really be here in 30 minutes or less. And then the ultimate question, do we have pizza or not pizza? And I say it's the ultimate question because it's a really easy go-to in New York. So I'm gonna narrow this problem space down to pizza. So I've taken, right, this huge amount of data that I could go dive into, right, all of the possible options of what we could have for dinner, and really focused on one small area to help drive us to a decision and be able to translate the results of the analysis that I do. So we're gonna have pizza, which means that while Ryan is rolling his eyes at me during this whole process, thinking this is a little bit overkill, I'm starting to think about the data and where I can get that data, which in this case is going to be from, uh, from Uber Eats. So I've just scraped some information from Uber Eats uh, on the pricing and the star ratings for some pizza places near my apartment that can deliver in 30 minutes or less. And even in small data sets, there's some cleaning that's involved. Uh, I gotta tidy this data up a little bit. And I know that I should probably consider some other sources of valuable information. And for this, I text my friend Dave, who is a huge foodie and I totally trust his recommendations. And I asked him to send me his pics for my neighborhood. So I've got, gone out and gathered a little more data for this process. And then I need to make sure that I can do some analysis on this data. So I'm just gonna convert that into something I can do some math on. And then I think about uh, you know, what do I need to analyze? I've prepped my data, I've cleaned my data, right? And this is all what I'm really excited about. Ryan is seriously getting annoyed at this point. Uh, but I'm doing this so we make a good decision. I'm giving a really data-based process here. Uh, so I think about what metrics I need to help him make his decision. And so, you know, doing the math for him, giving him the total cost is probably helpful as a metric. Um, Put some averages in so that we can benchmark values and compare you know what's above or below average and then for me i really want to make sure that we can trust uh, our general understanding of these reviews so i'm going to add in a confidence interval and at this point i've done my analysis and i'm ready to hand it off to ryan my decision maker to choose what we have for dinner or where we order from i guess what we have is decided on so anyone want to add in the chat here, what's, what's my decision? Where, or what's, what's Ryan's decision? Where do we go for dinner or order for dinner? So I've got a basil as an option. <laughs> so, right, there might be some other questions we need to ask, uh, is it vegetarian or not? So I do know that, you know, I live with Ryan, I know his, his uh, dietary restrictions or lack of restrictions. So this is data I probably didn't have to collect, but another good piece, if this is for an audience that's unknown. Maybe another basil, maybe piece de nostra. What we've hit upon here is a fundamental problem with 
providing analysis and not translating the results for our audience. It makes making a decision or utilizing that analysis in a way that's helpful, very difficult, right? So one way to translate what we do is to, right, think about how we're actually sharing the information. And a table is not helpful, right? You're all sort of running through some calculations in your head right now. You're comparing values. You're thinking about them. Uh, Davis said Pizza Nostra has the best price to performance ratio. So he's done some calculations in his head and keeping that number there. That's a lot of work, right? So if we visualize it, it's a little bit easier, right? And what we wanna do is think about the work our audience has to do to make sense of our information and do this translation for them. Visually, now this is a little bit easier, right? So I can very easily sort of cross out those places that are above average in cost and below average in star rating, right? I don't wanna overpay for something that tastes terrible, right? One of the, or both of the, uh, conditions I had to meet was that it was reasonably priced and delicious. So I can start narrowing down quadrants and I'm almost there. This is better. And so we heard basil and pizza nostra sort of as two options here. And what I want to do for that final step of translation of my analysis is to add a little bit of data storytelling. So just helping my audience really get the key takeaway and understand my recommendation from this. And so here I add a little color, I call it out. Uh, but basil, uh, that's, that's my interpretation of the data as well. Basil's our top choice, but if we need to, if for some reason they're overloaded and can't get to us in 30 minutes or less, we can go with Pizza Nostra. And it's probably just as good, but it doesn't have that little extra bit that Dave offers up. Okay, so with my insights curated and presented uh, and presenting all of my relevant information to Ryan, this analysis is now something much more useful and more importantly, we can get on to dinner, right? We can have some actual action around our analysis. And figuring out what to have for dinner is a really simplistic example, but I do think it is a great sort of microcosm of the challenges we have in getting people to understand and act on our analysis because we can start off really big and come up with all kinds of possible recommendations that don't actually address the problem that was being asked or doesn't help to make uh, a quick and powerful decision on the question that was being asked, right? So when we take this approach of sharing our results in a way that's easy to understand, that essential role of being a data translator, um, how we can be sure that you and your stakeholders, in this case, Ryan and I, are speaking the same language about the database decision of pizza. <laughs> so was it a good pizza? If it's from Basil, yes, it's usually always good. Um, I, haven't, I haven't had an off night from them yet. <laughs> so I want to sort of continuing with this, share a few ways that you can consider taking your analysis uh, in its raw form um, and help your audience with some visuals uh, and making that step towards translating into a shared language. So how do we go from that analysis, right? This sometimes complicated work that you've done into something that is more palatable and digestible for a mixed audience. And one thing to remember is that your analysis is interesting to you not necessarily to everyone that you're sharing it with, okay? So let's look at this example here. This could be uh, the results of a modeling built to help a bank better understand uh, their customers, right? So we have all of our variables here. We've got a report on their, their mean decrease to accuracy and what would happen if we remove them from the model. How do you explain to your stakeholder who asked you to build a predictive model on the probability of a loan default. You probably can't just put this chart up there, right? This is going to be really challenging for them to make sense of unless they understand random forest models and odds are they don't. So a small move 
is to tell them what that means. This little bit of text here helps you to translate the meaning of the results into something closer to a shared language. And the work that you do with data is complicated and you don't wanna dumb that down. You don't wanna make it less complex for your stakeholders, but we have to find a way to get them interested and engaged in a conversation and not make them feel like they're in over their head, right? Especially if you're presenting your results to someone who's more senior than you. The last thing someone who holds a leadership position wants to do is feel stupid. Right? feel like they don't know what you're talking about. And so that's where going the extra mile and doing that translation to help them better understand what you're talking about is really worth it. Right? A tiny little bit of text here about what removing a variable means can then make it stick right, into what are these results are, right? and knowing, okay, well then account balance is probably the most important variable that we wanna consider. Here's another example, right? Same issue here. If you consider your audience, odds are they don't know what test you just ran here. Um, and I'd argue that the results of Z tests or T tests uh, should never be displayed in a presentation to a mixed audience. This is super overwhelming, right? Just like a cut and paste from the analysis. So instead, focus on what that means. And this was analysis that was done uh, on the churn rate for customers for a, a, a cell phone service. And ultimately what's important from that analysis is that churned customers experienced almost two more dropped calls per month than customers who did not churn. And so here, focusing on that key takeaway, the key point that actually sticks with your audience, brings them into the conversation. And so this image here, uh, or this, this visual here, uh, is something that I call an impact metric. And this is where you focus your audience on a key value, or sometimes it's a couple of values, depending on what it is that you're sharing. Um, but that's really what you want them to focus on and consider and not be distracted by the noise that got you to this key value. And I encourage you to consider this option. The next time you have an insight that can be summed up by a single metric, um, instead of sharing exactly how you got that value, share the value and why that matters and turn the focus on what do you now do with this, right? So, Take things that are complicated, clear the noise out, pull out those valuable nuggets for your audience and translate those for them, right? The process is important, but it's ultimately going to confuse people who don't have that background. So have it available if they've asked questions, but don't lead out with that, right? We generally uh, can assume that our audience doesn't have the same sort of background we do when it comes to analysis. A general rule to follow uh, when you're sharing information, particularly to a mixed audience, is to always aim to reduce their cognitive load. So remove the need to make sense of charts uh, and have, remove the need for your audience to do the interpretation, to understand the key trend that you want them to see, or to even just make sense of the visual itself. Uh, even when you're presenting to a technical data audience, if you're presenting data that they're seeing for the first time, you may need to help them understand because you've been immersed in the data. What's obvious to you may not be obvious to your audience. In fact, it probably isn't obvious to your audience. And so we can work to reduce their cognitive load by being explicit about what they should see and take away from different visuals. So here's an example of a visual that it's not bad, right? This is a decent Tableau output. But if I'm looking at this for the first time, I don't know necessarily what to do with this, right? If I'm forced to understand this on my own, all of my brain power is going to reading this chart, comparing values, figuring out which product, right? And sales strategy work the best. When instead, if we've done that analysis, we should make that recommendation, right? So bad charts, what I call bad charts, are charts that make your audience work really hard. Uh, it's not immediately clear why they're looking at something. They might be overrun with too many colors that are distracting, so it's hard to tell what's actually important. Uh, bad charts, they run rampant because of 
the easy access to visualization software, and sometimes the bad defaults that come out of it. And taking a little time to enhance your visuals is always worth it, but sometimes constraints keep us from doing that. Here's another example of a chart that tried really hard, uh, but it takes a lot of work to interpret and figure out what it means. And a lot of our bad charts have a lot of potential. There's something really valuable somewhere in there to share. It's our job to do that digging and share it in a way that's clear. Okay. This one, aesthetically, not too bad. But if we look a little bit closer at it, the challenge here is that the narrative Facebook scandal erodes trust in media companies doesn't really match up with the data that we're sharing. We're sharing information about the bank, the DMV, the IRS, non-media companies, and non-time-based data, right? There's a disconnect here. We're making people work too hard to figure out why we're sharing what we're sharing. And sometimes our visuals just try to be cute and the overall importance is missed because of the complexity that's there. And sometimes they're just plain awful. Uh, this, is, this is my favorite like bad chart of all time, right? What in the world is someone supposed to do with this? Um, great. So we're talking about our banana imports and exports. Uh, we have sort of a very crazy 3D bar chart to do that with, and then really going overkill with this banana background here. So none of these charts reduced the cognitive load of our audience and made them have to think pretty hard about what we were sharing and why. So for your consideration, um, there are chart types that we want to use to explore data, um, to do uh, initial exploration, to sort of see what we're looking at. Um, and these charts can be any level of complexity, anything that you need to do your initial exploratory analysis. But it, when it comes to explaining our results, I suggest that you stick to three main chart types a line chart, a bar chart, and a scatter plot. Those three are usually enough, and if you're dealing with really complex data, then this isn't really the case, but these three charts will help you translate what you want to share with your audience in a way that they understand. Because these three charts are pretty commonplace, and you can be sure that they're not gonna spend their time trying to figure out how to understand them like they might with a waterfall or a Sankey. Uh, it's possible they haven't seen a box and whisker plot since they took stats in college, right? You're, you're giving them a visual that is almost second nature to read, right? And that's a piece of the translation, making sure that you're not making your audience work too hard to understand the visual. And we wanna make sure that we're inviting our audience to our level of expertise in a way that is not overwhelming. Um, and so the power of translating into terms that the general population can understand um, is really not celebrated enough. Taking these sort of complicated charts and making sure that everyone who needs the information can understand them is a really essential skill. Um, and there are some great tools for doing serious data mining and analysis. But sometimes that output creates some frustrating, uh, or sometimes that, that analysis, excuse me, creates some frustrating outputs for the layperson. So I'll use this example uh, from Luke Benz. So this is a great chart created by Luke Benz. Uh, he has a real, if you're into college basketball, when it comes back, uh, he has a phenomenal R package that mines for and analyzes uh, the NCAA basketball games, like all of them. Um, and I think his work is genius if you know how to understand it. So this is a probability win chart that he shared from the UNC Duke game from last February. So my husband, Ryan, who we made that very important pizza decision for earlier, uh, is a Tar Heels fan. He, he went to college at North Carolina. So he and all of his buddies have this tech stream going. And so every time there's a Carolina game, it's just like nonstop 
uh, conversation about what's going on, particularly when they play Duke, because this is a serious rivalry. And this game last February was really, really tight. It went back and forth, and it was closer than anyone who had followed the Tar Heels uh, play up until that point in the season could have possibly predicted. The Tar Heels weren't doing that great. Duke is a, Duke is a powerhouse. And uh, so after that game, one of our friends shared this uh, tweet by Luke Benz. And Ryan, who despite uh, you know this challenge he had choosing dinner, uh, he's an accountant. He deals with data all the time. He is what I would call a numbers person. He showed me this. He said, Deidre, what does this mean? Like, I like the way it looks, but what is going on? And so in this very interesting, complicated program that Luke wrote, he forgot about his audience. He's making them work too hard to understand the ups and downs of the game. And so the programming that pulled this out and gave us the win percentage is really interesting and creates a really aesthetically pleasing visual. But for most people, it's a little uh, hard to understand. So when we have outputs like this, we want to think about what that means for our audience. And again, doing that translation for the people who need to use this information. So I did a very quick makeover of Luke's chart. Um, and I wanted to focus on my audience, who in this case was Ryan. So I'm just going to focus on the probability of a UNC win. So I took out Duke from the equation because winning percentages are inverses, right? It's part of why that was so aesthetically pleasing because we had symmetry. Um, but if it's 20% that Carolina is going to win, we've got 80% up here for Duke. We don't actually need both data series, right? So I pull out the redundant information and then I start thinking about what do I need to call out to make this probability chart make sense? So what's going on at the half? You know, second half was really intense. This game was a really long time ago. So it's, I'm trying to remember it in my head, but I remember it being a very stressful game. And it went into overtime. And there's actually multiple times when Carolina could have won the game, but Duke came out with a last minute shot. And this is all very interesting, but again, doesn't necessarily cater to translating this chart for my audience. And this is where a little bit of commentary really comes in, right? Thinking about my audience, UNC keeps breaking fans' hearts. Just skimming that title in that most valuable real estate up there gives you an idea of what the end result of that game was, right? Calling out what happened there in the last moment buckets by Duke, bringing what had been a really probable UNC win crashing down. So think about who you're sharing your analysis and your visuals with and how you can make that easier for them to understand. It doesn't change, right, what it is that you're sharing, but it's giving them a language. It's giving them the opportunity to engage with you and understand where you're coming from. And so my final example here is how data storytelling, this whole process of translating for your audience, thinking about using good visuals and helping your audience focus on key information. Uh, this is how data storytelling can change your life or improve your life, maybe not change your life. Uh, I'm gonna share a personal data story with you. I feel like I've talked about Ryan a lot uh, over this talk. Um, but he and I have been together for almost a decade. This is us younger and happier and able to travel. Um, we have been together for a really long time. And anyone who is in this room with us right here, who's in a long-term relationship, uh, whether that's with a roommate, with a spouse, with a partner, maybe with children, uh, know that when you live with someone for a long time, that can be challenging. And so what I did was a very one-sided data collection of what it's like to live with Ryan. And I ranked his habits around the house on whether they're easy for him to do or difficult to do and whether I enjoy them or irritate, they irritate me. And this is where the translation piece, thinking about the story, thinking about what you need your audience to act on really comes into play. So, one data point there that may stick out to you is parking the car, 
Uh, again, I live in Brooklyn where I need to parallel park on alternate sides of the street um, multiple times a week. It's really annoying, so it's a big deal. What do we do with this data? Well, we think about what action we need to come out of it. So I've just met all of you. And one possible way to translate this data into something that is accessible to my audience is to talk about how great Ryan is, right? Parking the car is what makes him an all-star partner, but all those things he does that is a little, uh, just takes a little bit of effort really is what makes him stand apart. I can gush to you, but all these great things that he does. I can also think about what I really want out of this data. And that's possibly a little bit of behavior change from Brian. And so an alternate way to think about translating this data into something actionable is to think about what I need him to do. And focusing on the good thing that he does, parking, his car, parking the car almost makes up for his annoying habits. And that number one thing that really drives me crazy of picking his socks up off the floor or just leaving them on the floor makes, drives me crazy. And here, there's another little subtle change and something for you to consider, and it's the language that you use. And whether it's a shared language that your team has that an outsider wouldn't understand, or language you need to change for emphasis and importance. Um, so this used to be uh, irritating and enjoyable, but I really don't think Ryan cares if he irritates me. I think that actually might be his goal sometimes. So I need to sort of strengthen the language around this right? And make it grounds for divorce, right? This is really serious. This is something that really annoys me. It's not just funny. Um, and that may be something you need to do with your audience as well. What are the language changes you need to make? Where are you using jargon that they might not understand? And use that as a piece of your translation as well to make sure you're bringing them in and engaging them with your story. And so this was a very brief uh, overview and thinking about the role translating your work into a language that's shared and understood by your stakeholders, uh, the importance that can take and the value that brings to your work. Um, so focus on your audience. Really think about what they know, what's their technical level, what do they need to know, and plan your analysis and the problem that you're going to dive into with them in mind to make sure you're using your resources and your time wisely. To do that, you need to ask the right question. And that might be really considering what your stakeholders need, sitting down with them, and again, not making the data your priority, but making the question your priority. Um, <laughs> and to do that, that's gonna allow you to stay out of rabbit holes, right? Going really deep into that data, trying to find that golden nugget that no one else could find. That's not, again, what's gonna be the most valuable piece necessarily. So asking that right question to focus on the right data. And one thing to really think about is how you're sharing your analysis visually, right? How are you helping your audience understand through your visuals uh, to get the impact of what you've done? And overall, just really tackling a problem, taking any time you're communicating with data uh, by embracing the role of a translator. And I'd say that's sort of the most important piece by flipping the switch in your head of not what am I interested in or how would I share this, but what does my audience need and how do I need to sort of interpret what I've done so that it resonates with them. And it's not necessarily easy to do. Uh, it takes some practice and it's certainly more difficult depending on the type of work that you do. Uh, some cases are easier than others, uh, but really just consider this, this different mindset and this different way of considering how you might start communicating about your work and the different steps it takes to interpret for your audience. Okay, um, so don't be a stranger. We're gonna have time for question and answer, but. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, or you can reach out whoops, uh, via my email um, if you want to talk more about data translation, data storytelling, um, see some of the work that I do. But I think it's so important that we bridge the communication gap between data practitioners um, and decision makers and business leaders. So uh, I'm always up for a conversation about that. Okay. okay. Um, so we have some time for question and answer. If there's anything you want me to dive deeper into or take a look at, um, you know, happy to, to take some time to do that before we, we call it a night.
Uh, I don't know if you know uh, if you saw that, but uh, looks like there's already a question uh, in the Q and A section. Oh yeah, sorry, I was answering these as we went along. So actually, those are all oh, gotcha. those have all been answered. I just haven't hit the check mark there, but thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll clear them all now so they don't confuse us. Oh, so Darius has asked a great question about word clouds uh, and my opinion on them. Uh, so word clouds are fun. Uh, so we use a tool um, actually, we can do it right now if you want, if you're in the room. Um, oh, I need to change what I'm sharing. So I often use to just gather some information uh, with people, uh, a tool called Mentimeter. Let me just share. We'll go to it here and let's make a word cloud. Okay, so what you'll do is I'll start a presentation in just a second and it's going to give you a code to put in. And I'm just going to change the question real quick because it wasn't set to be a word cloud question. Oh, there it is. I was going to say, I know I created one for you. All right, so this is going to say describe your job role in um, five words or less. Don't do that because that's going to be challenging, but just tell me your uh, need to do like your job or like the company you work for. Um, okay, so to get this word cloud going, if you go to menti.com, and it's actually easy to do this on your phone, it works pretty well. Uh, on a mobile device, if you go to menti.com and then put in the code that's on the top of the screen there, 40, 46, 53, two. We'll start building a word cloud. And I'll, if I find my phone here, I can get this party started. Don't be shy. There we go. So here's, here's a little coming in. So word clouds are fun and we're seeing this happen now, um, right? Some people use them particularly, I think there's one in the Reddit example of like uh, words used in Biden's campaign versus words used in Trump's campaign. And the size of the word is supposed to represent frequency with which that word is used in comparison to others, right? So the bigger the word, the more often that that response came up. So actually right now, it seems like we don't have anyone who has a uh, repeat job. So I'm gonna pick one and repeat it and we'll see what happens. I do need to make sure I spell it correctly for this version to work. Ah, there it is. So I put in sales manager. There we go. We've got another data scientist. So that's showing us here in this word cloud relative to the other words that we have more responses. So here's the thing. I don't hate word clouds. I think they're fun. I think that uh, they're a great way to show prevalence of text, uh, but they're not great if you need people to understand exactly what's going on. So I think there are two people that put in, uh, maybe three people who put in data scientists. I was the second person who put in sales manager. So theoretically sales manager is twice as big as operations manager. Data scientist is three times as big, but it's really hard to tell visually. And it's really hard to compare, particularly if we had a lot of different size text going on. So I think that word clouds are fun. I think if your goal is that you need people to understand the underlying numbers from a word cloud, you wanna think of a different way to display it. So again, they're fun, but are sometimes challenging to display data. We can keep this going if you want, <laughs> take it down. But thanks Darius for that question. Okay, 
Um, Finnegan's asked, is it hard to analyze big data when you need to communicate with an audience you might not be familiar with or doesn't have a specific goal for the information you've gathered? Yes, I feel like communicating <laughs> um, and analyzing is always a challenge. So what I would offer up as a starting point when you're in a situation like this is to consider the general need for the analysis that you're doing on big data. So is it, I don't know, medical records? Is it banking data? Um, and think about what are some possible outcomes that people would be interested in. Um, and that also tie back to why you may have been asked to do this analysis. And then um, you might wanna consider different audiences that could be, or different members of your audience. So you might want to speak for, uh, uh, you might want to think about, you know, what is an overall summary that you could give that would speak to leadership. Uh, then you might want to think about one or two technical components that you could dive into for the people who are subject matter experts, but in a way that doesn't alienate uh, people who may not have that level of expertise. And so there's still a lot of really interesting things that you can come up with with the analysis. Um, it's trying to work on how you can make that engaging to a varied audience. Um, and so I know that's like a very, some very specific answer, um, but really think about creating a couple of personas of who you think could be in the audience and what you think their goals might be um, and consider working your analysis around that. Okay. Um, so Dalip has asked, uh, can I speak about how storytelling relates um, to ensure that you're also ethical and fair and not being biased? Um, and perhaps an example would help. I think an example would definitely help. Um, let me, so one, uh, I'll just pull up uh, something from a class that I teach. Uh, so I, like a big part of my role is helping organizations communicate with data and do so in a way, oftentimes when it comes to like presentations where you have a specific goal in mind. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't share data that is challenging or that may uh, be information that your audience doesn't wanna see or hear. Um, a lot of the components of data storytelling are about using uh, visual, uh, so psychological and visual principles and, and processing to draw your audience's attention somewhere specific so that you clear out the noise for them. And I will get an example of that once this other presentation opens for me here. Sorry, my decks are huge and sometimes that causes PowerPoint to freak out a little bit. So just take a moment here. And so let me just do a little experiment with you on how you can draw your audience's attention to something you're sharing with them. Um, again, not to be deceptive, but to focus their attention. And as I say, this PowerPoint is completely freaking out. So <laughs> we'll just give this a second here. It's been a long day. For my computer. I'm on the East Coast. Uh, so it's been going now for a little over 12 hours and apparently does not enjoy that. Okay, so here, actually, I don't think I'm sharing the right thing. Let me actually present this. So one way that you can draw your audience's attention to some key information is through something called pre-attentive attributes. So really quickly, just try to count the number of W's that appear right there. It's pretty hard, right? it's just a block of text. And you're looking at every single letter, trying to decide if it's a W or not, and then moving on. Now, same thing, block of text, count the number of W's you see. Okay. 
much easier, right? Because they were highlighted. So the answer there is six. One more time, same type of experiment, but in this time, instead of counting the W's, try to count how many G's there are. So the letter G, like giraffe. Right, that was pretty awful, right? So what we do with pre-attentive attributes is, and I do this a lot with the charts that I create, is I often push the information I don't need my audience to focus on. It's still available, but I don't need to focus, have them focus on it. I push it to gray. And so here's an example of this will not necessarily uh, make sense because this is from the middle of the lesson, but here, if I want my audience to focus on the portfolio default rate versus the cumulative number of loans in the portfolio in this data set, I'm going to think about pushing the less important data series to the back and using an alerting color like red to highlight that portfolio default rate and then adding some little markers to, again, draw your attention to the values that are there. Um, so this is something called pre-attentive attributes, and it really comes into the data storytelling piece, that idea of, of making visuals really clear and getting straight to the point and taking the work of interpretation out uh, of your audience's hands. Uh, and it's not hiding any information, it's just getting them to focus on a specific piece. So I never advocate deception, um, but there are definitely some visual cues that you can use to help you direct your audience's focus and certainly using, uh, these are called storytelling titles here, to quickly allow your audience to skim what you've come up with as your analysis and see how the data supports that. Um, so yes, it is a very fine line sometimes about uh, telling a story and being ethical with data, but you never want to deceive. Um, if you were sharing information that you didn't have particularly an opinion about, maybe it's at a team meeting and you don't need to direct your, your team's attention anywhere, the visual practices also just help declutter and help you focus in on the data to help use that to make decisions. So I hope that answered your question, um, Philippe. Okay, looks like we've got two more here. Um, so. This question is, sometimes the audience is savvy. Um, what types of charts or graphs do you recommend to a savvy audience, right? Yeah, so a line chart, a bar chart, scatter plot may feel really elementary to a savvier audience. Um, I think, you know, this is really hard to say you should always use, uh, like this type of chart should always be in your arsenal. Um, I think, you know, breaking out um, some Senkis if you're showing a process, if you're talking uh, to a financial based audience, a waterfall is certainly appropriate. Um, but if you are able to get a feel for the types of charts that they regularly see in reports or dashboards that they use, um, you could feel pretty confident using those types of charts as well, right? So it's something that they have regular access to and interaction with. Um, so I would, um, uh, you know, there's no sort of like, use charts X, Y, and Z, but think about what they might already use and be comfortable with, and then sort of add that to your toolbox. Um, you just still don't want to do anything too complicated. Um, and whatever it is that you share, you want to make sure that again, it's like sort of as clean as possible to uh, and uncluttered so that what they're looking at isn't muddied by, you know, redundant labels or crazy axes um, and, you know, so those, those good principles would be applied. Okay, and uh, from Christopher uh, asking, do I normally start with the insight, uh, like the churn picture, and then go to the detail for each section, or just show the insights and see if they have questions later? So <laughs> a great question. For me, it really depends on what the purpose is that I'm sharing. Um, generally, uh, like from that churn presentation, it's some recommendations to reduce churn. And so uh, there's a few different structures that I consider when I'm presenting information. One of the ones that I find to be really effective um, 
is to start big picture. So overall, what's happening? So what were the churn numbers for last year? What did that mean in terms of lost customers? What does that mean in terms of lost revenue? Just really do some level setting about the big picture of what's happening. And then dive into some of the causes of, of churn that I've found in my analysis. And so I will usually, um, I wouldn't normally show, you know, sort of a complicated analysis like the, the lost calls in a presentation. I would sort of ease into why that's a reason uh, that we should consider improving our service. Um, so uh, there's, there's a lot of different structures you can use when you're sharing that. I find uh, if you have a group that is hard to hold their attention. Sometimes going the executive summary route where um, you sort of say, look, we did the analysis and we found X, Y, Z, and now let me share with you exactly how we got there. That can be really valuable uh, because people know right away the direction that your analysis and your sharing is going to take. And so sometimes that's good for holding people in. So this is a so it's an unsatisfying answer to say it depends, uh, but it does depend a little bit on your audience and what they're expecting and really how you can weave your analysis into a, a cogent and cohesive narrative of, you know, I looked at all of this and this is where it got me to these recommendations for you. I also tend to include an appendix uh, when I do a data heavy presentation. So I sort of go light initially um, so that I keep people's attention. And then when we stop and pause for questions, I have the ability to pull up a deeper analysis or a deeper dive into the, the data. Um, oh, <laughs> Dave asked me a question about this example. Uh, so this is just a made up example from a class uh, that we used to walk through. Uh, some different com visual components. Uh, so that is, this is not real data. Uh, it's just there as a uh, example in different visual elements. So there is actually not a clear relationship between the cumulative number of loans and that default rate. Okay, and besides Tufti and the New York Times, any other resources, books to understand modern data presentation? Um, not for designers, but for managers and consumers of data. Sure, I would say Tufti is actually, uh, Tufti is not an easy read. Uh, Tufti is um, very technical in many of his books. I would recommend, um, I think Stephen Fuse showed me the numbers and Stephen Fuse blog, which is called The Perceptual Edge. Uh, those are two really great places to start, both to Again, there's the understanding piece uh, and the consuming it and why things might have been presented that way. And then again, if you turn yourself into a designer, um, that can be helpful. And then in terms of, um, huh, that's, this is a great question because I often think about it from the designer perspective, um, but the consumer's data piece, definitely Stephen Few and his blog Great question. Um, so Stephen Few, uh, let me put this, I'll put it in here to everyone. If you use Tableau, Stephen Few uh, was a major uh, contributor to the design elements and chart types in Tableau. They had a very public falling out a couple of years ago, so he's no longer associated with Tableau, but he's a great mind in, in data biz. Um, his blog is called uh, The Perceptual um, I don't know if it's .com or .org, but if you just search the perceptual edge, um, you'll get his blog and he has really great insights on um, and critiques of, of modern uh, visualizations and things he sees out in the world as well. Great. Okay, so that looks like all of the Q&A from the Q&A panel. So okay. I think we might Great. be yeah. all set. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you so much for coming, Deidre. And thank you everyone else for coming and being here. Uh, you know, we really try to hold these talks to keep people learning and keep people expanding uh, on what their whatever their current education was. So thank you for coming here and letting us all do that today.
Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Magnumind Academy. We upload recordings of this lecture. It will be on our YouTube channel shortly afterwards. And also please uh, come to our next scheduled meetup on October 21st. It's called uh, Model Selection 101. Thanks everyone and have a good night. Thanks, bye.